Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. Hey folks, it's 2019 and this is Bruce Hutchin and you're going to listen to this in in a few weeks but with Jeanette Hall and Jeanette is a global hunter that some people call him huntress because they're a lady but she's a hunter, no difference than you and I. She's an author, upcoming budding author and she's got a book coming out in April, May, Jeanette Getting Wild in the Kitchen. So all you organic minded people, it's going to be great and I can't wait to get with her. Jeanette also is on pro staff with a good friend of mine, Christy Pike, CEO of Proas Hunting Apparel. And if Jeanette is one thing, and we did a warm-up and talked about a lot of things, she's passionate about hunting, and her story will certainly support that, but she's very passionate about hunting Africa. So having said that, Jeanette Hall, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Bruce. And I'm excited. I mean, we, we just had a great warm-up and getting to know each other. And, and, folks, I do that with all my guests. So if you're a guest uh, on the show in the future, just spend time getting to know people. If you're going to be a guest on any podcast, get to know people. Because for hunters, then we're all hunters. And we have so much in common, as I always say. Hunting around the campfire, we're all on common ground. No matter where you come from, it doesn't matter. We're all hunters. And Jeanette, so we're going to sit around the campfire here for a while, and we're going to Perfect. talk. And, and you know, let's just go back to the beginning when you're nine years old, and Dad took you out, and and you went hunting for the first time. What was that like? Oh, it was actually my granddad that took me out, and okay. we went out with his old service revolver. It was just a little twenty-two, and he would set up a target on a big oak tree in Tennessee, and uh, this was just in Middle Tennessee, out by a little tiny place called Brush Creek. And that was my playground. Back then in the 70s, it was okay to turn a kid loose and let them roam the countryside without worry of some predator attacking them or stealing them or anything like that. So I had a really awesome childhood running amok and doing all the things that I love to do. My biggest thing is you would always find me in the creek turning over rocks to look for snakes. I was always looking for snakes and crawdads and fishing. And I mean, I just had such a neat outdoorsy childhood that nowadays you don't see that with kids anymore. Yeah. I started off life, Forces Center in Rhode Island, and we lived on a hill, quintessential New England, New England town, and the brook ran through it. And, you know, we're always on the brook catching trout, catching frogs. I trapped my first fox along that creek. And so you're right. I'd get on my bicycle at 8 o'clock in the morning and be home for supper. Yes. That was, and I was we gone. Had a big bell. Yeah, I was never in the house. I was always outside. I never had shoes on. So, I mean, you know, you would see me running across the pasture and think, how does she do that? But yeah, you, I never wore shoes when I was a kid. So I loved it. I loved being outside. And then when I was introduced to shooting, that just made things even more fun. It, it brought out, okay, you know, I can go out, I can shoot a rabbit. And then I was taught, well, this is food. You're not just killing. This is something that you need to respect. And I was shown the proper steps in hunting. I was shown to care for the game, care for the meat, and have a lot of respect for the hunt. That's important. Like a lot of people I know, you know, they they don't get that. They're just out there to shoot. And I think that a big component of it is is not just going out there and, and shooting something. The big part is going out there and having an adventure and enjoying what's out there and for me is the icing on the cake is just being out there you know you mentioned the journey the adventure and in europe germany they have a tradition and they give every animal they kill or harvest their last bunch or brunch and basically they take, pardon me yes weedman shield okay explain that because you obviously okay. you know the german name of it <laughs> 
yes, I have a lot of friends there. And yeah, what you do is, is you share your last meal. So you break off a branch from a spruce tree and put it in their mouth. And then you put one in your hat, put a, a spruce bough in your hat. And so you've shared the last meal with that animal. And it's kind of a send off. Thank you for your life for my meal. You're honoring that animal. It's, and um, they don't just do it just in Germany now. They, uh, I'm seeing it pop up everywhere in Africa and New Zealand. Even sometimes I've seen it happen here. So it's a growing tradition, and I like it. I think it's actually it's a nice send-off. And we could spend a lot of time talking on that. And I think throughout this podcast, folks, you're going to hear from two people that respect every animal that they've ever harvested. and. Grips and grins are great. I've got a bunch of them. Jeanette's got a bunch of them because we're proud of our trophy. We earned hard. We spent money, worked hard for our trophy. But actually, even more so, we respect it because we're going to take that trophy and we're going to eat it. All the deer that we killed at our farm, we eat them. We, we, We turn them into meat that's pure organic. And so one thing you're going to hear from Whitetail Rendezvous this year is is respecting the harvest even more and what you just said about a growing tradition in other parts of the world need to come to america that's my thoughts your two cents on that jeanette you know the more you travel the more humbled you will be my first trip to africa was the most humbling thing i've ever had happen to me it changed me in ways i had no idea i could be changed and the more that you travel and see different cultures and see different ways that they take care of their animals and their meat, the more it opens your mind and broadens possibility. So I think that travel is huge. If you can travel to the U.S., if you can travel to Canada, if you can go to Africa or Europe or New Zealand, go, because that travel just adds more to your repertoire. It's going to add more to your heart. You're going to meet people that will take pieces of your heart with them when you leave. Like you'll very hard to explain to somebody that's never been somewhere outside of, say, for instance, if you've always only ever hunted Tennessee and you've never been anywhere else, you just know that one little spot. So it's hard for you to understand when I'm talking about going to Namibia and seeing the sand people and listening to their stories and watch how they make their bill comp. It's very difficult to convey that, hey, they don't have a a freezer to put their meat in. They don't have a refrigerator. And Their floors are dirt. They don't have wood or carpet or anything like that. So it really changes your perspective on everything. Well said on that. And I have to just reflect back into my journeys in the white tail world over, you know, the last 50-some years. And, And I just remember every single coffee shop I've gone into, don't care what state, it's very similar to the one that I left in in Wisconsin or in New New England or in Colorado, once you get away from the big city. And there are just people that everybody has a story. And that's one thing about the podcast is I love hearing your stories and you sharing those things about your journey. So let's start off on your hunts this year. Tell me about your hunts this year and the journeys and a couple of ah uh-huh moments that you said, wow, I'm glad I'm here. Not because of the game oh, you took, this was a but because of the year. people. Yes, this was a pretty fantastic year. I started off this year with a wild boar. I got it around the first week of January. And there's quite a few of them around here. They're, they're pretty nasty pests. They tear up crops. They're just a nuisance. And on top of that, a lot of people don't realize that these wild boars actually eat fawns. So, I mean, it's important to hunt this invasive species that, I mean, these are Russian boars. They're not supposed to be here. So for me, it was good to get that guy taken out of the population because that's a few fawns that I managed to save. Who knows how many they eat a year. So it was was good to take that guy out. And of course, it provided some meat. So that was great. But for me, this year came in the fall when the fireworks really started. And that kicked off in October. I was having a lot of trouble locating a bear. In the spring, I was hunting over baits, which a lot of people find that controversial, but I have some great rebuttals towards that. I had one bear come in that was, he was a really nice bear, but you could tell he was probably four to five years old. Very leggy bear, so that told me he he still had some growing to do. So I I actually drew down on him, and at 20 yards, I decided to let down and not arrow him. 
and I let him walk and it was really enjoyable watching this guy just kind of looking around and you could tell that there was a bigger bear in the area just with how nervous he was. He could care less we were sitting in the tree, but yeah, he was definitely wary of another bear that was in the area. And yeah, he grabbed his, his beaver and took off. So that was fun to watch, but I still wanted a bear and I love to eat bear. I cook a lot of bear meat and I haven't had a bear since 2006. So I'm kind of a little bear poor here. So I was really craving some bear meat. And as the season went on, the June season closed. And so then I had to wait for what fall to roll around. And usually if you don't get your bear here by October, it's a pretty good chance you're not going to see a bear because once the snow starts to fly, they go straight into their dens. Now the grizzly bears, they'll still be out and about. And I came across lots of grizzlies, but I wasn't seeing any black bears. And uh, it seemed to be a little bit disheartening. I was seeing some tracks and lots of scat, but no bears to go with that. And one day we just happened to be out for a walk and we were going down a cut line and I had my 300 with me just because I was hoping to see a bear, but uh, you just never know what's going to happen. So we walked down the cut line and he stepped out and I just was in shock. I wasn't expecting to see a bear and bam, there's a, a nice 350 pound boar standing there. And luckily he gave me just enough time to get my scope on him and I dropped him right in his tracks and I walked up and took a look in his mouth and his teeth were so old. They were worn down, busted, broken, just that was a gift of a bear because that's exactly what you want to take. You want to take an animal that is old, that is probably not breeding anymore with his teeth being broken down like that. He probably wasn't going to live a whole lot longer anyway. So this was a much kinder way for him to die. And I was tickled because now I've got some bear meat. And on top of that, I've got a really, really, really nice bear rug to go with it. And I also have a skull to go in my collection that scores over 20 inches. So it was a huge win for me. It was, and it was such a gift because it was so unexpected. Let's go back. You're in the tree stand and a leggy bear comes in. So folks, if you haven't done a lot of bear hunting, you can just by in 30 seconds, you can get a really good handle of the age of the bear, possibly the sex, by just observing the bear. And so let's just take that down. So when a bear comes into the bay, Let's talk about a young bear versus an older bear, you know, physical characteristics. First thing you're going to notice is the ears are going to look huge. On a small bear, they're going to have these big Mickey Mouse ears, and they're going to have pretty long legs. They're not going to have a, a belly that drags towards the ground. They're not going to have that big swagger. They're going to kind of walk in like a puppy dog in a way. They're always going to be looking around to a young bear is a bear that can easily be eaten by another bear. So they're always on alert. Those younger bears, they're also a little bit cockier when it comes to people. Those are the bears that you usually hear about charging. And I can tell you from firsthand experience that four-year-old boar that thinks he owns that bait is a pretty dangerous animal. Um, I've had them mock charge me before and it's uh pretty hair-raising experience that will definitely keep you on your toes. I don't like shooting those bears. They're, they're just not ready to, uh, to be harvested yet. They've got some growing to do, and so I like to, to leave those bears alone. So those, if they do mock charge, I'll give them a face full of bear spray if they're getting in that close. Otherwise, I'm not going to shoot them unless it's absolutely necessary. And luckily, I haven't had to do that yet. Now, what about the head? I've been told a big boar, his head looks big, not just on a grizzly, but on a black bear. Oh, they're just monstrous. The one that I got this uh, this October, his head was just massive. I've got some pictures where I've picking up his head, and I could barely pick his head up. It was so heavy. But, I mean, his ears look super tiny, and the main thing is the width between the ears. If his ears are fairly close together, that's a pretty small bear, but once those ears start to slide over to the side of the head, you know that's a really good bear. Yeah, and the other thing is I've been taught is that if his belly's you know, scratching the ground, shoot him. Oh, absolutely. That's a big bear. And that's what I saw with this one. This one was just a tubby, fat bear. And and to be honest, I do prefer a fall bear over a spring bear. If you think about it, the spring bear is good to eat, but they have been hibernating now for sometimes seven, eight months. So if they've been in the den that long not eating, they're just living off of 
the fat that they've had. A lot of this stuff now you have to keep in mind when they're in hibernation, they don't urinate and they do not defecate. So all of that is just being recycled back through their system. And so that's why they don't taste nearly as good as a fall bear because a fall bear, they've been foraging all year. Their system's working perfect. And you have to also keep in mind that they're eating berries. And so they're going to taste a lot sweeter. And for me, that is a super big treat because the fall bear just, they're delicious. And then you've got also the bonus of the fat. Um, I like to render the fat. You can do all sorts of things with the fat. You can cook with it. Man, can you make some good biscuits with some bear fat? I also render it down and I use it for my horses if they have a scrape or a cut. Bear fat will heal a horse faster than any other salve you can think of. There's some backcountry wisdom right there, folks, and heard that. I've never had horses, so I can't see if it works, but Jeanette Hall does, and it does work. Municipal benefits of the animals we take, if you learn about them, you'd be amazed. Oh, absolutely. There's so much you can do with, they're just not just meat and just hide. There's a lot more to it than that. Did you hunt whitetails this fall? I did, and I was successful. I took a really nice four by five. Kind of funny story on him. I wasn't expecting. I was getting down to the last couple of days, and I was like, oh, man, this is something that's got to really happen. This has been a very poor year here in Alberta for whitetails. Unfortunately, road hunting has become a big problem, and it's it's something that a large amount of the population does, even though it is not legal. It's driven the deer way back into the back. And so with that comes the issue of trying to get back in there and find a deer, which this year, all the deer moved a lot later than usual. It was after season that I saw all the big ones. That's pretty typical, but uh, our season ends the, the last day of November. And usually around the first week of December, that's when all the big guys step out. So uh, this deer, he was pretty nice, a uh, big body deer. I got a lot of meat off of him. Uh, he was about 350 pounds, so he had some good weight on him. Not the biggest deer body-wise that I've ever taken. My biggest one was 400 pounds. And he was like looking at a horse. But yeah, this guy here, he, he was loaded with fat. And again, the tallow, you can absolutely use that, render that down. And I was, was pretty happy with him. I only use a 300 wind mag. That's my gun of choice up here is that is very versatile gun. You can use that for bear, moose, elk, deer, you name it. It's perfect. Works good on coyotes too. What kind of bullet do you use? I use a 180 grain Hornady Custom. For everything. For everything. Because I know you get the flexibility to go up and down, and I've tried that with my rifles. But then years ago, I decided, okay, make it real simple. 100 yard, five shot, cover them with a quarter, whatever that bullet is, shoot it. And the load when you hand load. And it makes it right. a lot more simpler. So that's another tip. Find what your gun shoots the best, and this it doesn't matter what you go after. Put the shot where it needs to be. 300 will take anything in North America, including grizzly bears, and stick that. That's a tip from Bruce, if you will. Your thoughts on that technique? Oh, absolutely. I went through a lot of ammo through that gun before I finally found something that it liked. It it hated just about every kind of ammo. And then once I got into the Hornadies, it was like, yep, that's the one. And it took it was expensive because I did go through a lot of different types of ammo. But once I found it, um, I've been shooting that ammo now for, oh gosh, I don't know, about six years and love it. I actually cut my stock down. I got a custom Boyd stock for Valentine's Day last year and got it cut down to fit me. And as soon as I got that cut down, that thing was absolutely deadly. Very, very rare did I miss a shot. I'm not trying to brag. I'm just, that's just, it was once you got the thing dialed in, it was incredible. Like if I wanted it, I got it. And, and that, that confidence gives you so much. If you're confident in your rifle, you're limitless. It's amazing what you can do with that gun. Yeah, I agree. And the big thing I just add, every single year, put through a box of shells, 20 shells in the summertime, and then put on your hunting gear and just know that that rifle is your friend. You absolutely, there's no question of where the bullet's going to go. So when that moment comes then it's just muscle memory and you just pull the trigger and the game's going to get harvested very ethically and it's going to die quick. Exactly. And that's what you want. You don't want something to run a few hundred yards. The running thing that you would be surprised how much that affects your meat. The meat quality is huge. If you've got a lot of adrenaline running through that animal, that really alters not only the taste, but the texture as well. So 
if you can surprise that animal and knock it down without it knowing what happened, your meat is going to be so much better. Agreed. That's for sure. So we shot a Russian boar in Alberta, Canada, which is invasive species. There's an open season on that, isn't there? Actually, in a lot of counties, we have bounties. So if you take a pair of ears in, you'll get $50. Okay. Because they are a problem. There's, there's... They're a huge problem. There was a lot of guys up here that were trying to farm them. And it's almost impossible to keep those things caged in. And with tusks that big, and they're very powerful animals, they also, I mean, huge. You're talking a 500-pound animal that they look at a fence and they're like, yeah, like that's going to keep me in. So all of these animals are escapees, and they breed so fast that it's impossible. Once they get out and you've got a few running, you've got a huge problem on your hands. So if you're going to Alberta, guys and gals, think about that opportunity because it eats well, that's for sure. Yes, it does. Mix is great with deer, too. Let's just talk just a tad on why you're in love with cooking wild game. To be honest, it's because of a medical condition. I used to eat nothing but garbage food. I used to eat out all the time. I ate at McDonald's all the time. Pretty much three days or or three meals out of the day, I was eating fast food. And next thing you know, I started having issues with my vision. I started feeling not so great. And so I went in and got myself checked out. And lo and behold, they found a brain tumor. And I said, wow, something's got to change. And so I changed my eating. And that's about the same time when I got into hunting, right around that 2002 mark. And so once I got into hunting, that was it. I wasn't buying any more meat from the grocery store ever again. And it's true. I haven't bought meat from the grocery store in about 15 years. And there's no reason to. I hunt enough that I can sustain myself year round. Ah, so what you put in your body fuel not only fuels your body, but it can cause problems or it can correct problems, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'm actually on the mend. I'm doing a lot better now. The, the brain tumor is now manageable. And I honestly believe because I'm eating right. I'm eating real food instead of processed meat. What does that really mean? Does that mean I just don't go to the grocery store anymore and buy meat at the meat counter? Honestly, I don't. I don't know what has happened to that meat. I don't know what's in it. I don't know who's touched it. I don't know if someone has not washed their hands when they went to the washroom and then come back and started cutting meat again. Honestly, I I do know there were gloves, but... You just don't know. Did they sneeze on it? Did they drop it? You just don't know. And that's one of the things that prompted me into cutting my own meat and learning how to make the cuts and process the entire animal myself. And folks, with YouTube video, it isn't that hard to take a deer apart. Sure, it's heck easy to do. It's easy. It is very easy. And do you have videos up on that or not yet? Not yet. Uh, I am working on it. I do have some YouTube videos of me doing grouse. So I've got a couple of me showing how to prepare a grouse, and then I also have a video of me actually cooking it. When you do your scans, has your tumor shrunk at all? It has. Without chemo? That's correct. Huh. How's that work? Honestly, I'm telling you, whatever they're putting in people's foods, whatever these pesticides and everything else that is getting dumped into the food, it's very bad for you. Very, very bad. So we know organic is huge. And we were talking about the diet. What diet is the rage right now? Yes, the keto diet and the paleo diet. Okay, what are they, please? Honestly, the paleo diet is basically what you would eat if you were a paleolithic man. So you would go back in time. You're eating a lot of whole grains. You're eating a lot of meat. You're eating whole foods like whole milk, whole butter, None of this margarine garbage. So it's it's a very wholesome diet. I think it's a fabulous diet because it's what we were designed in the first place to eat. We're supposed to eat uh, legumes. We're supposed to eat lots of this stuff that we can grow ourselves and also find in nature. You can go out into the woods, go find yourself some chaga. That stuff is amazing. You can find it growing on trees. And there's so many things that you can do outdoors that will actually make your health so much better. You know, and folks, it's January and everybody made the resolution, okay, I'm going to go elk hunting in September and October next fall. I've got to lose 20 pounds and i got to be in shape because I kind of lost it. And that happens to millions of us. 
And I'll raise my hand right along with everybody. And what we're finding, and there's a huge business, and I think everybody knows Cameron Hayne has created the hunting athlete. A huge business has just come off of that because you can just Google fit to hunt and there's probably 10 people that pop up. But you can get all the fitness in the world if you're not putting the right fuel in your body, then it's not going to work out so well. Your thoughts on that, Jeanette? That's exactly right. And if you go to McDonald's, you're going to find a lot of times that you're going to get, you'll just feel sluggish afterwards. Sometimes I do have to stop. If I'm in town, I'm running lots of errands, my blood sugar gets a little bit low, I'll stop and grab a fast food burger. And within 20 minutes, I feel sick. I actually feel because my body's not used to eating garbage anymore. So when you eat stuff like that, it takes away your energy. And then you come home, you want to lay on the couch, you don't want to do anything. On the other hand, if you eat a big fat elk steak and you go out, then you're going to feel so much better. Put some vegetables with that, some onions, some mushrooms, even mushrooms that you found yourself. You can go out there and find some good mushrooms in the fall and in the spring. And that just recharges your body. And, you know, okay, you have a little bit of trouble getting outside in the wintertime because it's ugly. What I do is I say, huh, well, this is a perfect time to go shed hunting. And so I'll go out there and I'll go for walks because let's face it, after Christmas, we have eaten ourselves to death and we've all gained a little bit of weight. I'm being one of them. And so with that thought of, hey, I could find an antler. I might not, but I could. And with that prospect, that gets me outdoors, and I go walking deer trails. Now, do you carry your 300 just in case Mr. Wolf comes by? <laughs> you bet I do. <laughs> uh, you know, it's nice to be able to do that and go out. So, folks, when you think about you get goals set up, you get hunting goals set up, and if you're not booked out, if you don't have your hunting plan set for how many states you're going to put in for, what states you're going to, DIY, if you haven't reached out to all the DNR people, one, you need to do that right now. Two, you need to look and say, okay, I need to be in shape. Yes, you need to be in shape to go deer hunting. And there's a lot of people that hunt the gun season, and they don't think about it because they're going to drive to within 100 yards of their deer stand or to their deer stand, the ATV. They're going to climb a ladder, get in a blind in their tree stand, sit there, come down and then go home. So it isn't physically. What I challenge you is, if you're going to do all day sit, tremendous benefit to you to be in shape. Why? Because mentally, you'll be able to handle it. And your thoughts on that, Jeanette? Oh, big time. I went on a mountain goat hunt in 2016 in northern British Columbia, and that was the most physically and mentally demanding hunt I've ever been on in my life. It was a huge hunt. It's Honestly, it's my, the best hunt I've ever done, and mainly because it was so difficult. And had I not prepared for it months and months before I went, I can't even imagine going on a hunt like that without preparing for something that huge. That If you go up in conditions like that, you, people have died. And you know, even experienced people have died going up there after these mountain goats. So That was huge. You have to be in shape mentally as well. I mean, you've got to think about you are thousands of kilometers away from help. If something happens up there, how are you going to get out? You've got to have all kinds of game plans in place before you even do a hunt like this. Agreed. And I I almost roped up to retrieve my mountain goat. And the guide said, what do you think? And I said, I can do it. We had to go down a chute and we could do it by pinching. It was almost like a chimney. And so, of course, the mountain goat fell down this chimney, and he was laying at the bottom. (laughs) And, folks, just think of rock climbing up a chimney, and that's pretty much it. But that was the most I was scared going down. Going, I knew I could get back up, but going down, it's like you're looking, and you go, holy fright. But I did it. Um, Wow. Well, see, mine was just the opposite. Going up was the worst part because we came down and it wasn't so bad. It was in daylight. But then once we got my goat cut up, we had to go back up. One of the flashlights failed, the headlamp failed, and then we went up the wrong way. And we were on shale that you took two steps up and went back about five steps. Uh. And and the one guy behind me, I thought we lost him. He took a bad uh, slip and he went way back. And I thought, oh man, we're going to lose him. And 
we all have meat on our backs and the, the hide and there's grizzly bears all over the place. And I'm just thinking, wow, how are we going to get out of here? And I pulled the trigger at, at 6 p.m. We didn't make it back to camp until 3 a.m. And that, that was just, it was crazy. It was one of the scariest things I've ever done in my life. Oh, yeah. Folks, if you haven't been on Scree, well, what can I tell you? <laughs> Go find a sand dune on the side of a building and climb it. <laughs> <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> oh, oh. Man, oh, man. So your health now. So doctor every six months or how do you manage Yeah, it? I go in for MRIs every six months. Um, and then my neurologist works with my optometrist because uh, it's pressing on my optic nerves. And mm. so with that, I've lost all of my peripheral, which has affected my hunting because I can't see to my sides anymore. I have to physically turn my head if I want to see. It's basically the same as if you're looking through binoculars full time, except you don't have that great a vision. So I can only see just a little bit. I can't see directly below me. I can't see above me and I can't see the sides. So unfortunately, I have to move my head more than I want to, especially if I'm still hunting. I've really got to look around and use my ears. That's turned into something that I've really had to depend on a lot now is listening for, can I hear them walking? Because now that my sight isn't what it used to be, I've had to basically depend on different senses. And smell, too. You can actually smell these redded up bucks. You can smell them from actually quite far away if you really know what to smell for. And same with elk. This year, wow, that my bull was just, you could smell him from 200 yards away. And it's pretty amazing how your body will kind of, once something has been taken away, how it'll flip over and it will actually increase in areas where it wasn't so much before. You're an amazing individual. I'm just doing what makes me happy, and hunting makes me tremendously happy. Because a lot of people, and you know them, would have possibly taken a different route with the physical challenges and with something lingering that's manageable, but still lingering. Yeah. You know? Wow. If I couldn't hunt, I don't know what I would do. That would be a pretty sad day when I, I can't hunt anymore, and I'm just hoping that's in my 80s or 90s when I say, okay, I can't do this anymore, but I really want to continue on with this for a long time. And my optometrist, I've been working with him, and he's fabulous. Um, he set me up with some, some good contacts, and so now I can see really, really well far away because my vision now has constricted so badly that without the contacts, I can only see about – for three to four feet in front of me before everything becomes completely blurry. And there's no way they can release that on the optic nerve? Unfortunately, it's in a bad spot. It's on top of my pituitary gland, which is, of course, messes up a lot of other things because that's your master gland. But the problem is, yeah, they can go through my nose and they can get in there and get it, but um, I'm looking at a 50% chance of it coming back and then also coming back even larger. And then also air travel is going to be an issue for me for quite a while. And with me going to Africa, that's going to be a little bit difficult to get there. So I'm kind of holding off as long as I possibly can because I got a lot of places I still want to see. I haven't been to New Zealand yet, and I really want to go there, and I want to check out Australia, and I want to hunt Germany. So I've still got a lot of places to go, and that requires an airplane. And if I go through with the surgery, then that might be put off for who knows how long. Huh. Wow. Folks, we all have a story. There isn't one of us listening to this that don't have a story, but we're hearing from an incredible lady with a passion for hunting. And this is one reason why we do the show is to uncover these people and, and let you know that whatever your story is, you're not alone. People are out there going through something themselves. Janet, if somebody wants to reach out to you, what's the best way to do that? Absolutely. You can find me on Facebook. I also have a hunting page on Facebook called Adventures in Hunting with Jeanette Hall. And you're more than welcome to check that out. I'm also on Instagram under Alberta Huntress. So I'd love to connect with you guys out there. You can follow along and see what I'm up to. I put a lot of cooking and hunting and horses. I'm very big into horses. I do mounted archery as well. So you can check that out. And yeah, I'd love to meet more people. And if anyone else is out there is with a brain tumor and dealing with that, I'd love to connect with you and, and talk to you about it. And especially if somebody has had surgery, I would love to see how did they do? Did it come back? And it would be good to to know for my own peace of mind. Now, do you have a website at all? 
I don't. I used to, and uh, yeah, it just wasn't getting very much traffic. It was getting way more traffic on Facebook, so I went ahead and shut it down. Okay, so it's Jeanette Hall on Facebook, or Jeanette Hall, what was the other Facebook page? Adventures in Hunting with Jeanette Hall. Adventures of Hunting or with Hunting? Adventures in Hunting. In Hunting. Okay. Just making a note. That'll be up on the blog, Perfect. folks, and, and you'll be able to reach all her social media channels. So here we are. We've got some backfill, and you got some great stories. But warm-up, you talked about your passion. I asked you a question. I said, what are you most passionate about in hunting? And you didn't hesitate. And it's Africa. And yes. There's more in hunting Africa than just harvesting game and having grits and grin. That's for sure. I myself have never had that privilege, but I have very close friends that lots of time. One of my friends grew up in, in Africa. Let's just start unpacking in the last half of the show here. Let's talk about your passion of Africa. Well, I have been dreaming of Africa since I was nine years old, sitting on my granddad's lap looking at National Geographic magazine. And I would see these animals and just so much of Africa captivated me. And I knew that one day I had to go. And that dream finally came true for me in September of 2011. I went to Namibia and I hunted with some amazing people. It was just being there, flying in. It was so surreal that it was actually happening for me. And when we touched down at the airport, I looked around and it was just I couldn't believe I made it. And my poor PH, uh, you know, I just sat there just, look at that. There's a zebra. Look over there. There's a this and that. And he's like, yeah, I know. I see that every day. And, and for me, it was just, you know, I was like a kid. It just was so beautiful. And then I started, I was bow hunting. So in my blind, I would sit there and I'd, I'd kind of chat with my PH while we were just waiting for game to come in. And I learned so much from him. He actually was in a book that I purchased before I went to the airport. And he was conservationist of the year in Namibia in 2006, which was really interesting that I was hunting with someone that is so passionate about conservation. And we had some great conservation topics that we touched on, like poaching and how is that affecting Africa and how is that coming from somebody that's never been there to see these things. And while we're sitting there, what comes up a black rhino? And he says, this is a treat, you know, here you go. Here is, is an animal that is highly endangered and you get to see one at 20 yards away. And the things that we got to see, it was so amazing. I mean, we had an elephant come in and we were sitting underneath an acacia tree that had fallen over. That was our blind. And watching this bull elephant come in, he's like, you know, this is getting a little close. So let's give him some room. So we got up and he saw us and his ears kind of flared out and he came towards us. The next thing you know, he's 50 yards away and I'm, I just have a bow in my hand. I'm like, oh yeah, this is a dangerous situation and spoke to the elephant in Afrikaans and the elephant backed off and turned away and then he went over to the water hole and we got to watch him for 20 minutes, take a bath and then he went and, and put some dust on him and walked away and an hour later I shot my dream animal, my kudu bull came in to that exact spot. The whole hunt was such a dream hunt. And it wasn't so much the hunt itself of me taking a kudu and, and the other animals that I took. The dream also became real when the villagers came in and we watched them divvy up the meat. And having those villagers come and shake your hand and express extreme gratitude for that meat to take back to their village really changed everything for me. These people, they don't have refrigerators. They don't have freezers. You walk into their village and every house has dirt on the floor. They don't have wood floors or carpet or anything like that. I mean, it's very primitive living. And to me, it captivated me. It, it was like, you know what? These people don't have the stresses that I have at home. They don't stress about a car payment. They don't stress about a mortgage. They don't have any of these stresses that are actually giving us health problems back home. This is such a much simpler life to live. And I actually wanted to come home and throw away half my stuff and just live a lot like they do because, wow, can you imagine living a life like that where you don't have so much stress? And yeah, it was just really humbling for me to go and see that. I had never thought about that before until I went there. When you think about Africa and talk to people who hunt Africa or photo safari Africa or go to Africa and spend time 
with the people, not the people in the cities, just the people, all of a sudden you gain an understanding that you can echo what Jeanette just said. Hunting in Africa is about giving back. It's not about the grips and grins, but actually every morsel of that red meat is consumed very quickly. And yes. it's shared. And when you think about that, folks, you can do the same thing with your game here in North America. There's plenty of food pantries. There's plenty of places. I remember traveling one time, got an elk, and I wasn't going to fly at home. And so I just went, made a couple of calls to a couple of churches, said, I've got a couple hundred pounds boned out. I just need to do something with it. That was gone. It just took me a matter of hours to do that. Now, with Google and social media, blah, 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 you can get that meat gone in an hour or less. But think more about doing that because there's people in this country, United States of America and Canada, that go hungry every single night. Absolutely. I mean, here in Canada, they're just imposing what they call a meat tax. They're calling it a sin tax if you buy meat in the grocery store. I was just in Costco this weekend. A rack of beef ribs that's not very long was $92. And it's shocking to see what they're doing to people. The price of meat here is so expensive that, honestly, if I didn't hunt, I don't know how I would feed myself. I really don't because they have made it so expensive to purchase meat. Yes, it's ridiculous. It really is. So there are people that really need this meat. Here you get two doe tags and a buck tag. And if you're not going to use one of those does, by all means, give it to someone that needs it. Let's go back to your meat. Meat in the States is expensive. Hamburger, three, four bucks a pound. I'm just trying to think the last ribeyes I bought, they were expensive. 15 bucks a piece, I think. I don't understand this tax. And why would you want to tax the meat? unless they don't have enough supply. I don't understand that. Can you unpack that a little bit? What we have up here is they impose this carbon tax. And right now they're very much against farming, which is the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. So what they're doing is by imposing this meat tax, they're trying to limit how much people eat because they figure, well, if there's less cows, then there's less emissions from the farm, and which is stupid because in Canada, we have vast boreal forests. We produce less carbon than anyone else on the planet. And with all these trees that we have, it, we're in the minus. But we have a rather psychotic prime minister, which I'll probably get in trouble for saying that, but that's okay. That's how I feel. I feel that this puppet is trying very hard to destroy Canada and everything in it. And this is just one part of destroying Canada is to take away the people's food and take away the people's money. And then you've really got the people. They'll die. If you don't feed people, they're going to die. Forget about yes, taxes. This is, I mean, this of is their stupid. income. It is. It's very stupid what's happening here. And I'm watching it and just shake my head. It's really incredible watching this country or one person kill this country. Interesting, because you have fast, I've been up there goose hunting, I mean, townships of wheat fields. Yes. And most so he doesn't want people to grow wheat? Elsewhere. He doesn't want anyone to make a profit from anything, I don't believe. <laughs> He's something else. If you watch what's happening up here in Canada, you're seeing that we're having some really bad shifting. And this is an upcoming election year, so we're praying that people have the common sense to get him out. But unfortunately, there's so many people in the East, in the cities that don't really care what's happening in the country that he's likely going to get back in. And if he does, I don't see how Canada is going to survive. Well, those people in the cities are going to find out they got no groceries. There's nothing to eat. Good luck with that. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable what's happening. Because if I live in the country, I'm going to eat because I'll be there's a hunter-gatherer. There's going to be civil war happening here very soon in the next at least in the next few years, I guarantee it. Wow. Folks, I'm digressing, but this is actually a good segue because the world we live in is changing. Jeanette Hall, uh, international hunter, pro staff, pro us, well-known in the hunting circles, recently was told 
by one of her sponsors not to put up pictures anymore. What's about what's that all about? Well, when we renewed our contracts last year back in January, everything looked great and so I signed back on. And then in February, I received a revision. And in that revision, it says twice, you may not post any photos of African or exotic animals. And it says it twice in the revision. They were very adamant about you not posting African or exotic animals. And for about 24 hours after I made my post, I didn't expect it to go viral the way it did, but it blew up overnight. And as I was watching this whole thing, Still, after 24 hours, nothing from Cabela's. They had it, They still haven't contacted me via email or phone or any other way about any of this. So I just wanted to know why. I just wanted to know, you know, I mean, we're getting constantly bombarded by anti-hunters. And I saw this as a personal attack on hunters. Because if you're telling us you can't post certain photos of certain animals, I'm sorry, but why are you wanting us to hide? I just wanted answers. And I contacted corporate several times through phone and email asking them, what is this about? And they could not give me an answer. They would not give me an answer. And this frustrated me. By December, I had made up my mind that, you know what, this is wrong. I'm not going to be renewing my contract, even though I was sent a renewal. And I said, you know what, I think that the public should know what is happening with Cabela's. After this merger, a lot of things changed. And this was something that came on with that merger. So I'm not sure, but I do suspect it was something to do with the Bass Pro and one of their policies. So I made this post online because I wanted answers. I knew I would get an answer somehow, and I didn't expect it to go everywhere, but it did. And it was a good thing because it got Cabela's attention. And for the first couple days, they made a statement saying they knew nothing about it. And then on the fourth day, oh, well, it it must have come from someone inside and we didn't approve it. So I don't understand why they denied it the first few days and then come back and make another statement saying, well, yeah, we saw the email and we didn't approve of it, so someone must have done it on their own. So now my question is, whoever did it on their own, did they really do it on their own or did someone in corporate tell them to put that on there and they're going to end up taking the fall for them? Hmm. Okay. Your name's Jeanette Hall, correct? Yes. How long have you been a pro staff with Cabela's? Three years. And is this a paid or a volunteer? You're basically a volunteer. They don't cover your fuel, which for me, it's a three-hour drive round trip to go and do my presentation. So typically, I do a full weekend. I do Saturday and Sunday. So that's six hours worth of driving. And with gas, if you convert it the U.S. dollars per gallon, I'm paying about $5.25 a gallon. So that's a little bit on the expensive side, not to mention I also drive a truck. So, so are you going that, that from is, your home to Edmonton? Yes. Okay. I'll go in the morning, and I have to spend a minimum of eight hours there in the store talking. Mm-hmm. And then at the end of that, they give you a gift card that can only be spent in store for $150. Okay. And that's it. There's no... A lot of people seem to think that it was a paid position, which no one gets paid except possibly the ambassadors, which they're an ambassador and a pro staff are two totally different things. But none of us pro staffs were getting actual money. We just would get a gift card that had to be spent in store. So unfortunately, I couldn't use it to pay for my fuel. And then on top of that, the discounts changed drastically once Bass Pro took over. We used to get a pretty good discount. We'd get 25% off of most stuff. And even guns, we would get 5% off as well as ammo, we would get 5% off. And once Bass Pro took over, there were no more discounts on guns and ammo. And then you only got a discount on Cabela's branded items only. Everything else was full price. So we lost a huge amount of our discount. So really, we weren't getting a whole lot anymore for our efforts. I mean, I would do sometimes in one day, I would do three talks and each talk was about an hour. That was a lot of work. They wouldn't even promote us anymore. They wouldn't put us in their flyers and say, Jeanette is giving a talk on this weekend. Make sure you stop into this Cabela store and come see her. And and basically, we just were promoting for really nothing. So folks, 
the winds of change are here. They're not coming. They're here. And Cabela's started in Sydney, Nebraska. A couple of guys, a couple of brothers sold some flies. And actually, they didn't sell the flies. They gave the flies away. Those are flies for free. And you paid five bucks for postage. True story. They started a great business. And they were hunters. And they were pro everything. Now, it isn't that way anymore. And we're going to see more. Unfortunately, we're going to see more and more of this. So if you aspire to be on a pro staff, make sure you understand what that commitment is. Because just to have your name as a pro staff for XYZ company and one not get paid something of value, what's the point? Unless your ego's so huge that you say, oh, I'm on pro staff for this. Okay, fine. Where's the benefit? If you're listening to this show, you're a person who likes hunting. And you're like a lot of us, you desire to have a voice in the industry, whatever that is. Make a product, have a podcast, have a video, be on Pursuit Channel, whatever. You want to be in the industry because you love it so much, but it's still a business. And if you're so wealthy that you can just do it for nothing, God bless you. But most of us can't. So Jeanette Hall, ethical, honest, wonderful human being that has represented the hunting world well, has been told she can't post a picture on her website. I don't know where that's going, but it doesn't sound good to me. Jeanette? You know, the interesting thing is, is that once I posted this, I had ex-pro staff, ex-employees, ex-managers from Cabela's and Bass Pro contact me. And while they're trying to point the finger at Canada, saying that this came out of Canada, most of them were in the U.S. that I spoke with. And they said the same thing. They were not allowed to post photos of specific animals, Um, especially down in the States. They weren't allowed to post photos of wolves which I found very interesting. Hmm. Wow. Did not know that. I'm going to ATA, and it's my BC wolf fang. Now I'm going to for sure go to Cabela's booth. <laughs> <laughs> I have an investor in my podcast. I do the work, and he, he gives me the money. And we talked about Cabela's because we knew they were going to be there, and I said, what do you think? He says, well, that's a business decision, Bruce. That has nothing to do with anything. That's a business decision. And we'll have to make up a mind if they want to pay for sponsor your podcast. You have to play by their rules. And I said, well, what if I don't like their rules? Then I... <laughs> and Cabela's Bass Pro, we're a $37 billion industry. I don't know, you're $5 billion or what's your K-1 or your schedule, whatever it says. But we're a formidable force, so make sure you know the way you're going. And it's okay. J.C. Penning's going out of business, and Blockbuster Video went out of business. A lot of companies go out of business because they don't treat their customers right. So, folks, this is 2019, and, yeah, we haven't talked a lot about whitetail hunting, but these are things that our industry is evolving, changing. And if you're not aware of these, if you don't make some hard choices, because if you go and look at the spend, the average spend for a deer hunter, it's five to 10000 a year, average spend. Mine's a lot more than that because I travel, okay? I don't need any more gear, but I do travel. So there's travel costs, and I buy a lot of licenses. And I have a choice of where I get my stuff. It's as simple as that. And there's only 15 million whitetail hunters in the country, plus or minus a million. So just saying, Jeanette, what's your thoughts about that? I feel that with me coming public on that, I wanted the public to know what they're spending their money towards. You know, if you're unknowingly spending money at an outfit that claims to be for hunters, but yet really isn't, I think it's important that they know that. You know, if this is the way that they're going to go and say, no, we don't condone African hunting because it's bad for business. There's people that don't like it. We have people that buy camping gear and we don't wish to offend them. So that's why we're doing this. I feel that hunters need to know this. And this is just another way for us to lose more hunting rights. They're just chipping away constantly. We're every angle we're getting chipped at. Trappers, hunters, people that predator hunt. Every day we're being attacked. And to be attacked by a company that says they're for hunters, 
is really sickening to me. That goes against everything that I stand for, and I won't represent a company that is secretly doing something like this and not telling the public, yeah, well, we represent hunters, but just not African hunters or not wolf hunters. That is wrong. If you're against one hunting, you're against all hunting. I'm sorry. You can't pick and choose. You're either stand with hunters or you don't stand with them at all. I don't see it as anything but black and white as that. So fast forward to just a few days ago, a week ago, a commissioner, Idaho, went out Africa and hunted and posted some pictures that I don't think you and I would have posted. Your thoughts on that? I do agree that the photos that you post have to be tasteful. They have to be. And any African outfitter that's worth his salt will make sure that your animals in those photos look immaculate and tasteful because that's their business. If somebody posts bad photos in Africa of an animal that's dripping blood, that looks horrible, they realize that the public is going to see that and they're going to get backlash or they're going to have other hunters say, you know what, this doesn't look like a very good outfit. I think I'm going to pass and I'll go somewhere else. And like when I hunted Africa, they show up with gallon jugs of water to wash your animal off. They don't want any blood showing at all. They make sure that the tongues are inside. They make sure that the animal is set up in an area that looks pleasing to the eye. The animal is set up in a way that it looks natural and respectful. So by posting disrespectful photos, that's just fuels the fire. All of my photos are very, very tasteful. You don't see blood. You don't see tongues hanging out. They are very, very tastefully done that I could show them to anybody and they're not going to be offended unless they're hardcore and say, well, I won't look at any picture of any dead animal. But there are animals out there, yes. If you go shoot baby animals and post it and think it's funny, that's just tearing away at us, inviting people to attack us. You know, you've got to show pictures that represent an animal that was taken that i'm sorry it just those photos were poorly done those photos should have been kept under his hat those are your photos you can show those to your buddies but that's probably something that shouldn't have gotten out and i'm just still befuddled i i used to have a seated table here in colorado with the sportsman advisory council and any of us had done that i mean you would have had to resign. I mean, it, there wouldn't have been a question. I'm still trying to wrap my arms around why a person would do that. I don't know if he was gloating or I really don't know what his situation was. It's uh, much the same as the photo that was leaked out, Larissa, with the sex toy and the sheep. That should have never, ever gotten out. That puts such a black eye on hunting that it's unbelievable. Photos like that, you shouldn't have even taken that photo because I hate to say it, but everybody's got haters. I've got haters. You've probably got haters. We all have haters, and I'm sure Larissa has a few as well. And by taking a photo like that, you're risking someone getting a hold of that photo and putting it out there. So you have to really pick and choose. Do I want something like that accidentally getting out someday, or am I just going to take full photos that I'm proud to show off? You've got to make a choice, and that's a moral decision is what that is. It's real simple. With the digital world we live in, if you take a picture with your camera, somebody with some skills can get a hold of that picture. Yes. Any photo that you post anywhere that goes online, anyone can take it. I had a customer that was complaining that a photo of his mount that I did was put on an article. And I said, I have no control over what the media takes off my page. Since he posted that photo and tagged me in it, well, guess what? Now everyone can see it. And I said, I'm sorry that you're upset, but you're upset with the wrong person, my friend. You posted the photo. Once you posted that photo, anyone can get a hold of it. Anyone. So next time, maybe think about that. Yep. Terms and conditions and Facebook and all the social media folks, if you post something there, you have given it away. You don't have no exactly. intellectual property rights. Zero. Exactly. Zip. Or zip. So get over that because you don't own it anymore. That's just the way it is. That's where we live in. Good and bad yes. on social media, but that's where we live in. Wow. Africa, 
you're passionate about. Tell me one story about sitting around the campfire and having sundowners or not having sundowners and just reflecting on the day's activity. What was your major takeaway? It was so amazing to come in at night. You would hear the lions roaring. When I was in South Africa, it was during the rut for the Impala. And you would hear the males roar, which was a really interesting sound. You would hear them right up against the camp fighting. They were within just, you could actually bow hunt them right off a camp, but that was frowned upon. I mean, because we like to watch the animals from camp. You know, you're not going to go out there and just shoot it because it's right there. It's nice to have something to look at. And so every night when we would come in from our hunt, we were always greeted by the staff, which was my favorite. The staff is usually all villagers, and it's great because they have a job, and they would always hire husbands, wives, uncles, kids, even the kids were there playing. It was nice because it was kind of like a daycare for them. They could come in, and and we could see the kids, and I enjoyed that a lot. So the women that were in camp were the wives of the trackers, and I just really enjoyed coming into camp, and they would hand you a glass of your favorite drink. I loved having an Amarula after an evening hunt, and we'd sit at the fire, and we'd talk about what we saw that day, and whether it be, hey, I saw this animal, and I've never seen one of those, or you know what, I found this. My favorite story sitting around was I found a broke-off warthog tusk. And it was found at a water hole where a lot of bow hunters like to sit. And I just was like, that's the neatest thing here. I'm holding in my hand a piece of ivory and I am going to try to take this home. And they said, well, you know what we can do for you is we can make you a necklace out of it and you can just wear it home because it's a finished product. So I was just in love with this idea that, oh gosh, I don't even have to worry about anything. I can just bring it right home. It's a piece of ivory. So what they did was they dipped it in bleach. And they made sure to put it in some salt just to make sure it was disinfected as it is a bone. And then the wives, a lot of them would do beading and they take the beading and they sell it in stores in Johannesburg. So these ladies are incredible beaders. And I went into the little room that they were beading and I watched them intricately bead a design on this necklace. And they put it over my head with a string of leather and... For me, it was just like, wow, this is something I'm going to keep forever. This means so much to me. I am bringing home a piece of Africa that's tangible, that can take me back to that exact piece of time. And I can look at that and anytime I want, when I'm sitting at home, I can grab that piece of ivory and I'm right back at that water hole with that sun beating down. And I can smell the smells of Africa after a rain and listen to the guinea hens. And for me, that brings back so much happiness. And so you had no problems going through custom with the ivory? Not at all, because it was a finished piece of artwork. It was a finished piece of jewelry. So take that to heart, because there are specific regulations about ivory importing them into the United States or exporting them from Africa or ivory any place. And so if you're going to do that, even warless tusk up in uh, the Arctic, check the regs before you, you do that because you might not come home with it. Yeah, you've got to be careful. Now, since it was a finished piece, if it was unfinished, it was it was just a, a warthog tusk, then I wouldn't have been able to bring it back. I would have had to put it in with my crate with the rest of my trophies when they shipped it back. Since it was a finished piece of jewelry, then it was okay. Wow. So Africa is always with you. I know it's in your mind anyway, but now you have you can always. Just, it's a touchstone. Absolutely, always. And I do plan on going back. Got to get back there. There's something that happens to you when you get to Africa that something about that red soil gets in your blood and it just, it takes over your heart. And when you leave, you leave a part of your heart in Africa. So I feel it's important. I've got to get back and get back in touch with my, that piece of heart that I left and visit. And I hope that I can continue to visit for many, many years. Jeanette Hall, it's just absolute joy just to visit with you just have some conversation about hunting and and sharing some stories and then touching on where we are today in the hunting industry of which you're well read up on and the thought about igniting that desire i just dave freeman just sent me a, a text he's got a sale on, on sable for thirty five hundred dollars Wow. No, it's not gold medal, SCI gold medal or anything, but it's not just a a coal hunt either. And I bring that up simply to say that Africa is 
highly affordable. It is. It is so much cheaper than, say, for instance, going to Alaska. You can get 15 animals as opposed to three in Africa. So, And it's such a neat place to hunt. I mean, you're not hunting high fence. You go to Namibia, it's all wide open. You're not hunting fences. And same thing with South Africa. Some of these places you're looking at are 6,500 hectares. They're just massive places. You don't see a fence. And just to go there, you don't even have to hunt. While I was there, I had so much fun doing a, a pickup safari, which is where you pick up deadheads. I picked up an absolute monster of an impala and a huge heart of beast, and I brought them with my crate. You know, I had them put in, and yeah, it costs an extra like 150 bucks to get it dipped and packed, but completely worth it. I mean, you know, I had so much fun just, it's like hunting in a way, except you're getting the whole skull. Marvelous. So with that, folks, we're going to end this episode. Jeanette, when her book comes out, we're going to be doing a promo of Facebook Live and a promo for her on her book. So be watching for that. This show, we just kind of switched gears, and I have a virtual assistant now that is doing all my production. So uh, all I have to do is wait till this comes, and let's see. I've got your website. I've got your name. I get your address. The only thing I need from you is a short bio and then your pictures, North America okay. and Africa. We need some of those. And then uh, as soon as you get those to me, I'll send it to my production company, and uh, we'll be good to go. So, folks, there is some great things happening for Whitetail Rendezvous. As I said, when you hear this, I'll be back from ATA, but ATA is going to be a stepping stone this year for us. Two, I'm looking for ambassadors. I'm going to uh, invite 12 people to come and be an ambassador on Whitetail Rendezvous, and there's a lot of reasons for that, and it, it's just not – something that you're going to put on on uh, social media and say, I'm an ambassador for Whitetail Rendezvous. There's going to be more things to do than that. And then we're launching my Buckwild Coffee Company this year. That'll be coming up in later in the year. I've got some other exciting membership things coming up where everybody's going to be able to be a part of Whitetail Rendezvous. So 2019 looks like a fabulous year. You're my first guest, Jeanette Hall, for 2019. And certainly, We'll be staying close and doing more things down the road. So thank you. Thank you so much. And I just wish you all the best. Thank you so much, Bruce. This has been a real pleasure. I've really enjoyed talking to you today. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.